What's good? Will Freeman, RevolutionaryLifestyleDesign.com talking to you today about how to play the real estate rental game in developing markets. So my client has a buddy in Colombia who owns 11 apartments all in the same building. He bought them for like 70K each, put 30K into renovation, so 100K total. Rents them out on Airbnb, mostly to foreigners for long-term stays or wealthy people from Latin America. Uh, they're decent quality to good quality, so it's not slumlord type tenants or student types. These are, you know, sort of wealthy travelers or wealthy people from Latin America. Um, even though the, the place only cost 100K, after the renovations, you know, in Colombia, it's quite cheap. So it's a nice looking place and you can afford wealthy tenants. Uh, so all the properties are paid off. Total portfolio is about 1.1 million. And uh, he's getting 15% on these because you can get a lot more abroad because people are willing to pay a bit more in Colombia because there's a shortage of nice looking places with Western design that are properly managed. And, you know, these people have, you know, good incomes, right? Because they're a lot of the time getting paid in US dollars, uh, you know, so they can easily pay 1500 a month for a place in Colombia, even though the average property is 400, it's not much to them. So he's getting 15% on that. So, you know, that's about 150 grand a year, right? And, you know, let's put 11K a month. Um, you know, if he's American, he's getting the foreign earned income exclusion, right? So he's not paying taxes on his first 150K if, if the income is sourced outside of America. So he's getting 10K a month in Colombia to own these properties. And he's got a property manager. So that's pretty passive, right? And, you know, he's straight for income, assuming it adjusts to inflation, which one of the benefits of real estate is that it does. So another brother of mine that's in the RLD Brotherhood, revolutionarylifestylesound.com forward slash brotherhood, runs an Airbnb company in Thailand, and he can get 15% on high quality townhomes on the beach in Phuket, which is the uh, beach island in Thailand where you know, a lot of people go on vacation, both Thais and foreigners, um, renting to wealthy vacationers on Airbnb. So the rent on that might be um, 3000 or 4000 or something a month. Uh, but that's easy for a wealthy Thai person or an American who's there for, you know, two or three months with his family. And I know for my uh, real estate investor client, who's also in our brotherhood, and he's been very successful in America that the average cap rate in California is three to 5%. So that's straight trash compared to the 15% you can get abroad. Um, that's anywhere from 500% more abroad to 300% more. Uh, there's a big difference between 3% and 15%, especially if you're trying to live off the income, right? If you're trying to live off the income of a million dollar portfolio in America, even at a million dollars in property paid for no debt, 3% uh, is garbage, right? You need closer to 5 million paid off um, to be able to, you know, live, get your 20, 25 K and live comfortably in America. Um, Cause don't forget you're paying taxes on that. You know, whereas when you're abroad, if you're, if you're not American, you're not paying taxes in your home country and you're um, you know, if you are American, you are, you know, getting that first 150 K foreign income exclusion. So you're only worried about the local tax on the real estate. Um, but in most cases in, in Latin America and Southeast Asia, that would be significantly less than, than what you'd be paying in America, both business and personal. Uh, so to get 15% in America, you need some off campus student house. Even then you'd be lucky to get 15%. It's probably closer to 10%. Um, and that's certainly not easy to find. It's going to cost you a lot more than 70 grand plus some renovations, right? You might be looking at 500,000. Um, and there's the odds of your property being damaged by some seven frat bros that live in the place is 100%. Uh, you're going to be fixing things all the time. Uh, your property is going to be getting damaged every year with certainty. You're going to have problem tenants that you're going to have to kick out and that might not want to leave and that don't pay rent because you're dealing with bad tenants. Um, and that's really the only kind of place where you're able to even potentially get that type of return. Maybe some type of slumlord property that you fix up, but again, 
problems with tenants, problems with damage, um, you know, neighborhood is, is crime ridden or whatever. So let's say you've scaled your business exponentially over the next decade to where you're able to pull out six million to invest from salary and dividends, right? And in the early stages, you're just taking a, you know, let's say 10K a month living in Southeast Asia, right? You're comfortable. Business is going well, so your equity is going up every year, your your revenue is going up, but you're just dumping back in, right? You're not you're not trying to pull out right now and and you know fuck up your compound interest by buying a four hundred thousand dollar condo, right? So doing the math on six mil would be um, 90k per month in passive income at 15%, right? Uh, well, it, it would be somewhat passive if you're still managing it, um, but that's real money and that's a real business, right? Again, if you go back to my article from about eight, eight years ago where I tell you not to buy uh, a home on a mortgage, still agree with that, and I tell you not to rent um, not to go into the, the property rental business, still primarily agree with that until you're at a certain level of wealth and you want both wealth protection um, and passive income, right? At, at $5 million if you have to play with, now it starts to make sense, right? Because, you know, you want to diversify out of your business for psychological protection, right? Not have everything in your business. Otherwise, I would tell you just keep investing in your business forever or into new businesses because they beat all investments combined, right? But if you're looking for some solidification, right, and you've got some equity, some Bitcoin, some gold, and doesn't feel solid enough, and you also know that, you know, you're, you're not getting dividends from that. You can't live on that. You know, you've got to sell it to be able to live. And then if you're selling it, it negates a lot of the purposes because you can't just buy gold or, or equities and expect to sell a lot of it in two years time because you might be down. You don't know where the market's going to go. You, you know, if you're, if you're looking to invest in those things, it's more like you're making a long-term play and you're going to be holding it for at least a decade or 15 years to know that based on historical trends, you're going to come out up front, but you can't just, you know, expect to be able to sell half of it in, in three years time because you need the money. The only asset you can really do that on is real estate. And if it's 3%, it's not even really worth that much outside of, okay, there are these physical bank accounts that keep pace with inflation and, and can't be stolen. Um, but, you know, at the three, four million dollar level or whatever it is, even, you know, two, three million if, you're, if your business is going well, all of a sudden you have a real estate rental business that does 15%. And 15% margins in businesses is average, right? Um, that's what the average do business does. Um, so, and, and it's 15% for something that is pretty much passive, right? If you have a manager and um, the asset keeps pace with inflation, which is huge, seeing as we're in a high inflation environment, might go to a, you know, at some point a 30% inflation environment or always potentially a hyperinflation environment. And real estate rentals will keep pace with hyperinflation. I've, I've researched that. It might lose, you know, you might lose 30% of the value, but the 70% you maintain keeps pace with, with hyperinflation. Um, where your business might not, you know, that's the one big advantage of real estate over like a business. Um, the property will keep pace with, with hyperinflation. Um, so you've got an actual business, right? So this isn't personal investment. This is you buying real estate under a corporation, perhaps owned by a holding company in multiple countries to generate a passive income business where the asset and the principal keeps pace with inflation. Um, it's physical, it's solid, it can't be stolen. It's usually only gonna be seized in like an act of war or you know, perhaps a government takeover and confiscation. Um, and it's offering you a solid ass 15% dividend, you know, which is kind of standard for, for you know, business. But within a business, a lot of time, you got to reinvest a lot of that and take a, a smaller salary out. So it, it makes sense at a certain level, done in a certain way, um, hedged across multiple countries. And if you were the type of guy that's not going to feel completely secure, if all your assets are in, you know, business and, and cash and equities, where it's all just being held online in ether, and 
your psychology is a big part of this net worth game because the purpose of net worth really is just psychological or it's, it's insurance against some type of interruption in, in revenue. Um, that interruption might never happen and it's just buying you peace of mind. But if it does happen, um, you, you can sell off, you know, portions of your net worth and put it back into your businesses and various things. Right. Uh, so if, if the bulk of net worth is about, cause you, cause you always want to have your revenue scaling over time. Right. Um, and not be living off of going into savings and going down. Um, so if you assume that you're going to aim to have your revenue growing over time, you know, until you die, then, you know, real estate's primarily for psychological insurance. So if you feel a lot more solid with properties, you know, th this potential business is a great idea. Also, you, you get some tax benefits too, if it's, if it's done through uh, a corporation, right? Um, so I would say the second biggest benefit is assuming you buy title insurance, right? Um, property can't be stolen, can't be locked out of your funds like you could with a bank account, crypto exchange or the crypto exchange goes down like guys who lost money holding on FTX. Um, if you're holding in a cold wallet, a lot of people lost their crypto keys. Um, if you're holding gold in a facility in Singapore, there's KYC problems, there's theft problems, there's theft pop problems transporting the gold in, in, in and out. There might be some conversion issues in the future if, if the American government says, hey, you know, we want to, you know, they're, they're in some depression and they say you have to sell us back all your gold, just like they did in the Great Depression, right? These things can and do happen. Um, you know, but with real estate, you're mostly looking for you know, there, maybe there's a seizure in some type of act of war. If you've got the wrong passport, like what happened to some Russian people uh, during the war, um, a communist take and it's in the wrong country that has unfriendly relations with your passport country, some type of communist takeover, like that's happened in Latin America where they could seize foreigner lands or for some reason, removing foreigners from the country, even though Cambodia, which is a communist country, has been a great market for the past two decades to uh, invest in real estate. And if you want to learn more about that, check out Reed Kirschenbauer over at Invest Asian, who's been investing there for a decade. Um, they've had year over year GDP growth. And in Southeast Asia, you know, you, you can't own a uh, land per se, unless it's through uh, a corporation. You can structure it to where you effectively have control over it, but you can own a condo. Um, you can own it outright in your name, uh, even in, you know, communist countries like Vietnam or like um, Cambodia. And they're communist, but it's mostly in name only. Like they, you know, people own businesses, people own property to a degree. Um, you know, even in China, you can't perhaps own the property, but you have a 99 year lease on it to where you know, there's a, there's a healthy market and you could sell it before you die. And I mean, it's not ideal to have a 99 year lease, but on the other hand, you know, you're not planning on holding it for 99 years and you can always sell it to somebody else. Um, so that being said, you know, countries that are already communists, right. You can own property. So it would have to be a communist takeover and kind of a dumb regime. Um, you know, like, like we've seen in some Latin American countries where they, seize foreigners assets and promptly uh, crush the economy, uh, which I think these days is less likely to happen. Um, communism is, is not very popular these days. Um, now, on occasion, my, my real estate investor client told me his father had a, a property attempted to be seized by the government where they were trying to build highways. He had property in the countryside. Um, and you know, the property was worth 8 million. The government said, we need the property. We're going to give you 2.5 million for it. Right. So even then he wouldn't have lost hundred percent of his bag. He would have lost, you know, 60% of it, which stings, but he took the government to court and over, you know, four years, five years, he had the money to go to court and the know-how uh, was able to get the full 8 million for his property. So even in that case, um, he didn't actually end up losing money outside of the, the court fees. And if he had, it would have been, um, you know, he still would have got 
thirty percent of that back after he'd, you know, the property had. I think he owned it for like ten years. Had uh, you know appreciated, and he'd earned some money from from rental income. So maybe he would have got back, uh, you know, fifty percent of what he put in total. Um, but this is a guy who probably owns forty properties, right? And that was just that only happened to him once. That being said, I think that's the the government seizure for some type of highway is is less likely to happen in the strategy that I'm giving you where, um, you know, you'd be looking to buy these sort of high quality condos in in downtown, renovate them, rent it to Airbnb uh, Westerners, right? Or, you know, on the beach in in Phuket, um, where in those cases, they're they're probably not going to bulldoze condos in downtown to build out a highway, most likely. Uh, especially if you're near the business district and you're, you know, in, in places where you're around other wealthy people. It's more like if you're just owning land in the countryside or something and they want to build something out over there and you got some bad luck. Um, so that's that's my take on the on the seizure risk. Um, and I think I think the overall risk is much less than most people assume, especially having lived abroad for the last eight years, you know, and I have. I do have four bank accounts that I use um, that I haven't had problems with. I've had more problems with my Canadian accounts, which kept freezing my funds because I, I'm using my card abroad and the algorithm doesn't like it. Or I bought, you know, a touch of Bitcoin on, on an exchange and, you know, took me three months to uh, negotiate with the bank, send faxes and KYC documentation and phone calls just to get them to unfreeze the account and, and reopen it. And I promptly pulled all my money out of that account into my, um, you know, I think I have like 10 foreign accounts, right, in, in multiple continents at this point, um, where I, I haven't encountered any type of problem like that. So once you get abroad and you start living here and you realize, okay, there's 70 million people in Thailand, there's 210 million people in Indonesia, and the you know, the banking services work. And if you get, you know, you can get screwed on a property if you don't buy title insurance and, and the guys, you know, pretending to sell you a property or something. But if you talk with the right lawyers and you get title insurance, um, you know, you're, you're straight in that, in that regard. Um, and you, you know, your rights and all these different things. Uh, I think the, the risk is much lower than people would assume when they hear Southeast Asia or Eastern Europe or, Latin America, although I would say Latin America is a bit higher if you're talking about Venezuela and Argentina, where they have these histories of strong men coming in and, um, you know, trying to build out a socialist economy and, of course, failing. Um, but, you know, if it's a place like uh, Panama or Mexico or some of the more stable countries, even though Mexico has the cartel problem, it's still you know, good property rights and things of that nature. Um, you know, even Brazil in a lot of, a lot of cases, um, you know, they did have a problem in the early eighties, but, uh, you know, has been, you know, relatively good property rights for the last 20 years. Um, but certainly Eastern Europe and, and Southeast Asia, Russia and Ukraine excluded, um, could be some problems with, with that in the future, you know, if, if there's if that war extends out, but you know, um, I'd say your rights are probably good. And, and if you start to see a war coming or a, uh, takeover of strongman or something, um, it's, it's usually not things that happen out of the blue, right? That's, that's to say that like, you might have a two or three month runway where you're like, mm, I don't like the risk profile right now. Let me sell this, you know, let me put it on the market for, 5% less than everyone else and, and get rid of it, right? So I think the risk factor is a lot lower than most people would think. Um, you know, I would say a student housing building is, is probably a higher risk and a lower return uh, because you are going to get, you know, it's not going to get seized from you, but you're going to get property damage, right? And it's going to be a lot more management work. And there's also a risk of just owning all your property in one country, like in America, right? Um, you know, there, there could be changes in the tax laws, and that goes up significantly, changes in the rental laws. You could have something like COVID happen where, you know, if you owned a property for a year and a half, you weren't allowed to kick out a tenant that wasn't paying rent, right? Um, if you had all your properties there, you would have had a real income problem, right? 
Um, so I would say it's less risky to have, let's say, properties in six countries in Southeast Asia than it is to have the same amount of money invested but all your properties in America. Um, so there's the risk factor, um, but I think spreading across you know, continents and countries helps a great deal in that regard. And let's say you had the 6 million right at 15%, it's 90K a month. Um, even if you're giving, a good, you, you get a good property manager, you're giving him 15%, you're still ke keeping 80K, uh, right? To do no work outside of collect the check and, you know, sign the insurance document every year that your assistant handles, right? Um, and the dope thing is, you're doing it through a corporation, right? You know, probably set up in that country, probably owned by a holding co and a hold co in, let's say Dubai or the BVI. Um, and, and the money funnels into, you know, your bank account in that country, in that country's currency, right? So you, it comes equipped with bank account diversity, um, comes equipped with uh, currency diversity, right? To where you're, the funds are being stored in, in the currency of that country in that bank account. And in a lot of cases, if you're investing more than three, four hundred thousand dollars in the country, um, you can get a real estate investor's uh, visa, right? Um, you know, the, a lot of the visa situation is if you invest enough in property, you can get a long term visa. In a lot of cases, like Indonesia and, um, you know, in other places, it can lead to permanent residency over the case of five years, even if you're not living there most of the year. Um, so you get PR in another country. So it comes with these secondary benefits. And, you know, if you don't like holding the cash in, in that particular currency, right? Um, you can always send the cash to the, to your wise account, right? In, in that country's funds, um, convert it easily to whatever your USD and, and funnel it back up into, um, you know, your Dubai holding company, right? Holding it in USD or, you know, putting it back into your, uh, uh, other businesses or just, you know, funneling it into an account to, to live on it and, and respend it. Um, but that being said though, if you're, let's say you live in Southeast Asia, you've got bases between Thailand and Bali to account for, um, never having to deal with the rainy season, you know, it, it makes sense to have, you know, you can keep a lot of those funds in those particular, uh, bank accounts and currencies. In addition to that, um, you like to travel around with your girlfriends within Southeast Asia and go to places like Dalat, which is a mountain town in Vietnam, or, you know, um, Vientiane in Laos, which is a city that no one likes except for me. I think it's cool. It's like a, you know, it's got this old school French kind of vibe because it was a, a colony at some point and good food and it's a quaint little town, especially for a capital city. So you could be, um, you know, stacking money from that property in the country and then just spend it when you're on vacation and have your debit card. And, um, you know, in, in, in some cases, right, you could, um, you know, take these condos, right. And for, let's say June, July, it's unrentable on Airbnb during the seasons. Cause you're going to come in with your girlfriend and stay in VNTN for two months. Right. So if the condos are nice enough, um, and you block them out, and you're, and you're doing kind of like one to three month rentals on Airbnb uh, or booking, right? Then you've got some lifestyle investment for yourself and some vacation type deals, right? Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of benefits there to that. And yeah, I think it's a, a lot lower risk than, than, than people would assume. Um, and it's a diversification hedge uh, if, if let's say all your money comes from selling into America and USD, right. To get paid in those foreign currencies, uh, as well as just having funds in, in foreign bank accounts, you feel a lot safer, uh, especially when you understand banking and you see stuff like SVB blow up. Like that was a shock to me that some of these tech companies had all their money in SVB, all the, like it was their sole business bank account companies worth 40, hundred million. And they had like no idea of like, wealth protection, right? At least have some money in, you know, the four big American banks that are probably going to get bailed out, right? You don't want to be sitting there watching, 
you know, this new tech bank go down and hoping that uh, there's going to be a bailout or that your depositor's insurance is going to cover it, which it fucking won't, right? It covers up to 250K. Um, you know, so having those bank accounts is, is a nice thing. Um, and, you know, having that, that silo um, is very important. Having, having the, um, the silos of the different countries, right? Like, like the 6 million in six countries, it's 1 million uh, per country, right? Uh, because if one of those countries went down, for whatever reason, that million was seized, you still have 5 million across those other countries. And you can sort of think out 20, 30, 40, 50 years in advance. Okay, if, if worst case scenario, I lose one of them, you know, the rest have been accumulating for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. I'm all right with that, right? I'm all right with that to have this physical asset that I don't have to manage that gets me 15% and all these other benefits, right? Um, and that's assuming 15% is the max. I don't know if it is. Uh, I would bet you could find 20% if you looked hard enough and negotiated. In uh, Southeast Asia, a lot of the time, the best properties are not on any of the websites. It's finding a local to go around on the motorcycle and looking at tiny little signs that say, you know, for rent or for sale, right? A lot of the time the, the property's garbage, right? Uh, but sometimes you can find a shop front, um, you know, that, that you could renovate into something nice in a nice location for like 50 grand in, in Cambodia, right? If you wanted to do the dip your toe into commercial stuff. And that might get you 20% because, you know, that, that neighborhood is up and coming, right? Um, you know, and, and you had a killer buyer's agent who's going to get you the real price, right? And you had boots on the ground. You know, if I'm going to buy a property in, in uh, Thailand, I'm going to go with my buddy Ryan, who is a real estate agent and owns the Airbnb business because he's going to give me the real price as opposed to the foreigner price. It's quite hard. You know, I, I, I'm betting these guys that or the guy in Columbia that got 15%, he might have got a, a better price than the foreigner price. But I don't still th I think he got the full local price, especially the local price that you could have negotiated. For 70K, he might have been able to get that for 58K. Let's, I'm just assuming. Maybe he did, but in a lot of cases, it's, it's, it's not the case. Um, so to have a killer negotiator and someone to scope out all these off-market deals with tiny little signs, because in America, everything's built out. Everything's on Zillow. Um, everyone's got an agent, agents are advertising, etc. The market's very efficient. In Southeast Asia, it's extremely inefficient. There's wild differentials in prices based on if they think you're a foreigner or based on if they're actually savvy enough to put it up on a website. Most people aren't. Um, based on if they actually have done the research on their neighborhood and know exactly what the, the values are or you know if they n perhaps need money and need to get it sold quick. Um, you know, there's there's a lot that you could do on the deal. So you might be able to put something together where you're getting 20%, right? Maybe even 25%. Um, and let me just use 25% because it's a nice round number as an example. So let's say you got 25% across the board. You had 6 million to play with, you know, that you pulled out of your company in salaries and dividends over the next 10 years once you went exponential, right? And you put it into six different silos in six different Southeast Asian countries, a million per silo. And you're worried about the risk, right? Oh, it's not America, something bad could happen. But at 25%, you only need to own the, that per portfolio for four years to get your entire income back in, in, in dividends, right? It's 25% a year, um, you know, the property's accumulating. After four years, that's 100% that's back. Whereas the property in America at 5%, you need 20 years um, to get that money back in, in um, dividends, okay? And I'm not saying like the money's lost because it's still in the asset, but I'm saying you've doubled up um, in terms of still owning the asset, which maybe even more than doubled up because the, the price of the asset went up perhaps higher than inflation in, in, in that period of time. And, you know, you added 100% in terms of... of the interest that you received, right? Um, so let's say you got, you, you were four years into your, your investment of, of the six million across the six different countries at 25%. And in year five, 
one of your property silos in Cambodia, let's say, got seized by the government that was already communist and they said, all right, foreigners can't own anything, right? So you got a million dollars seized. Um, you would have already earned a million in rental income in that four year period, right? You would have, you would have made 250,000 a year over the course of four years. Um, yeah, you would have paid a bit of taxes, but you know, mostly you would have got that money back already. So you would have got back a million dollars in interest and then you would have lost the, so, so you would have had a million in property and then another million you got back in interest. So two mil total. But if they seized the million in property, you still would have made a million in interest and you would have pretty much broken even on that um, investment minus, uh, you know, the taxes that you paid. If you'd still had the money in the Laotian bank accounts, okay, maybe there'd be a problem, but ideally you would have seen this stuff coming in advance and tried to pull, pull your money out and, and um, even tried to sell the property, right? So, so the funds or the, the property getting seized is assuming that you didn't have a two, three month runway of seeing all this rumblings of the communist government, you know, rattling their sabers, right? Um, and on the other five mil, right, on the other silos uh, that didn't get seized, you'd be up another five mil on that right? So you'd have gotten a mil out of Cambodia, and then you'd have five mil in the other places, and five mil on top of that that you generated in rental income. So you'd have earned um, 12 mil total, and a mil had been seized, but total you'd still have 11 mil, right? Or, or you'd, you'd at least uh, earned that between dividends and what you own. Um, so even with, with losing that million dollars, uh, you would have a greater total than if you, if you'd had the whole bag in America at 5%, even with an entire million being seized, an entire silo going down, um, you know, on six mil in America at 5%, you're only up 1.2 mil over, over four years. Uh, in addition to you know, the six mil that you still have in property that's kept pace with inflation, right? So in a sense, um, it's a lot riskier to, you know, own something that generates 5% versus 25%. Um, you know, assuming it's not like ultra high risk, like some altcoin or whatever, right? Where there's a good chance it's going to zero. Um, now, I might be being quite aggressive here with 25%, but it was a nice round number where I could do, you know, four year multiple on something. I, I do believe it might be possible. I would say if the best I've seen is 15%, 20% probably is almost certainly, but I can tell you with, with certainty from two examples without even having to look very far that, you know, my guys or their friends are getting 15% in, in two different countries, right? So, that's just a solid plan, um, potentially for your future wealth protection and your future ability to, um, not even have to live off the earned income that you've got from the businesses and just be able to push that back into the businesses and push it back into more property and, you know, keep your 20% in gold and Bitcoin. And, um, I don't know, maybe some gambles on all coin, like dumb shit like that. And some dumb penny stocks or whatever, like it won't matter at that point because you've got so much hedged and the multiple bank accounts and stuff. And it's it's kind of like what Grant's doing, uh, Grant Cardone, where he just dumps everything in his high margin businesses and then pulls that out and puts it into rental properties, except he's all in on America. He's got a lot of debt and he's got a lot of investors so that, I mean, he's, he's able to earn a ton of money on it, but it doesn't quite buy the same psychological security that we'd be perhaps looking to buy by, um, you know, using the money to, to, to buy properties that you own outright um, and can earn you a good passive income because you're, you know, income arbitraging, right? Um, you know, and you're selling these wealthy foreigners and it gives you that peace of mind because you're like, yeah, I got six mil across the board in six different countries earning me this income. I'm never going broke, even if there's major problems in the businesses, even if there's hyperinflation, even if there's a deflationary depression, even if one of my businesses goes under, there's a major economic risk, 
that plus the bank accounts plus the other stuff that I have in gold and Bitcoin and equities or whatever, I'm not getting touched here, right? And, you know, Southeast Asia or whatever, unless I'm flying private, I can't really spend more than 25K a month, right? Or buying like nothing but Louis Vuitton, which most of you guys don't even care about. Um, so it is a good part of your uh, net worth plan to consider in the future, which is what I want to talk to you about is this is the kind of game that you'll get in my net worth course. Very deep, very thorough game on how to get an eight figure net worth. And it's not a guarantee, but it is a game plan with multiple examples based on your psychological profile, um, teaches you when to start pulling the money out and that you need to go an exponential in your business. And that's more important. And this is based around my study since basically the first three months of the pandemic when, once they put the lockdown on. I knew that the old game plan was out and for the last three years I've been studying this with myself, my clients, my business partners, talking about it at length in the Brotherhood, revolutionarylifestyledesign.com forward slash Brotherhood if you want to get this game in real time and, and talk with six, seven, eight figure entrepreneurs about our survival and thrival strategy over the next decade. And to see the reset coming, the AI, the ESG, the carbon credits, the social credits, the 15 minute cities, um, you know, programmable money, uh, AI coming to get rid of 40% of the workforce that's going to have to be on UBI, which is going to be a big um, financial liability for governments, the ever accumulating debt, um, inflation at 15%, uh, which, you know, could continue um, indefinitely, or we could see even higher than that over the next decade. We don't know how smooth this transition is going to be. And I'm not making a political statement any other way. I'm just telling you as a player in the game of life, the game is fucking changing and you've got a window and you need to take advantage of that window over the next seven years. We don't know how this is going to play out. Uh, but I come to the conclusion that Gold's not going to save you. Bitcoin's not going to save you, at least with certainty, right? You could go all in on Bitcoin and maybe it does go to 500,000 a coin, but maybe it goes to fucking zero. We don't know. But what will ensure your survival is aiming for a $10 million net worth over the next decade, or at the very least, you know, it's, it's a combination of you're, you're doing 5 million revenue across your businesses and you've got 5 million property or whatever, but it adds up between revenue and, and net worth to uh, 10 mil, I think. Um, because if, if you don't survive and thrive, who will, right, at that point? The solution is overcompensation, overcompensation, massive action. And that's the number I came up with where I was like, I have that. I'll be straight because if, if I'm not straight, right at the, and the high, at 10 mil is the top 50,000 out of 6 billion people. Right. So this is not an easy goal, but it is something to work towards. Um, if you're taking this stuff as seriously as I am, and that was the, the new number, right? So the, the advice I'm given in 2010s, it's great for the 2010s, make 20 K a month, do arbitrage tax minimized, live in Southeast Asia, Latin America, Eastern Europe. Advice for 2030, multiple seven figures, be aiming for eight mil across the board um, within the next decade. And hey man, if you fall short and end up with three or four, you know, you're, you're, you're still probably going to be good. But um, keep in mind, I'm saying 10 million in, in today's dollars, right? Um, you know, that the... Uh, if we hit high inflation, right, over the next decade, 10 mil might be worth 6 million, right, in, in today's dollars, right? But, you, but it, you're still going to need to hit that, that nominal number, right? So we're, we could be hitting some really high inflation, right? And you need to prep in advance for that, seeing the inflation level that we saw um, during the pandemic, right? And I think that the new lifestyle business is building up these high margin seven figure multiple seven figure businesses in niche sites 
selling courses, um, high margin service businesses. I'm calling it kind of the hustlepreneur model. Instead of the short-term hustler who doesn't build anything, it's in kind of a hustle industry except for the service businesses, which is like kind of legitimate. Um, margins are 50 to 80%, so you can afford to just dump back into marketing. And putting operators in place, that's the new lifestyle business, is having a hold co with operators in place to where you're above it. And in a sense, it's better than a lifestyle business because you're not having to be in the business. Um, and it's also better than, you know, a lot of guys trying to build an empire with really low margins and a ton of stress and all that stuff. Although I think, I think some of these um, flywheels that I have set up could go to 10 mil. I just won't be the one, you know, doing all the nuts and bolts of that, right? I'll have the CEO in there for, you know, 100 grand or whatever in the early stages or the CEO or whatever. Because um, once you start to get enough money, that's, that's an easy solution, right? And a lot of guys don't think like that, but you know, that to me is the ultimate lifestyle business where you've got a hold co and you're just speaking with operators about, you know, where's my money at, right? And you're thinking about new strategies in your current business to make money. You're thinking about potentially new strategies to um, get money from other vehicles. Now, I'm not saying to go ahead and start, you know, four different businesses if you haven't got above the first flow of income. Or if, if you think that you can put a lot of money back in the first flow of income, it's more when that first, you know, the flow of income is maxed out um, to look into other deals. But you could also do this with one business going to 10 million um, where you've got operators in there, right? It doesn't have to be multiple deals. It just depends on how much juice that particular deal has. Um, but this is the exact game plan that I delve into in the eight figure net worth course, how to get an eight figure net worth your game plan for becoming a decamillionaire um, over the next decade. And I do think that, you know, there's a good chance that the decamillionaire is the new millionaire a decade from now, because there's going to be a huge gap between the rich and the poor. We could see some massive inflation and now's, now's not the time to, to play around. It's time to start getting serious. And if, if that means a little bit of fear, I think that's a good thing. I'm not the fear monger guy. Uh, but I'm telling you, I'm taking this damn seriously and I'm approaching it with massive aggression. So go get you that course, revolutionarylifestyledesign.com forward slash courses. Uh, you won't regret it. It's probably the best thing that you can buy over the decade, in my not so humble opinion. And, you know, for anybody that understands this game and cares about you, they're going to be telling you the same thing. All right. So other than that, I appreciate you watching through this video. Appreciate your time. Much love to you. God bless you. And I'll catch you in the next video.